Hello everyone and welcome to another Atomic Mass Transmissions Live. I'm Will Schick, Director of Product Development for Atomic Mass Games. Excited that you can be here with me today. We're going to be painting a lot of red, and that's why I wore my red Spider-Man shirt. Uh, we're going to be painting Crimson Dynamo from the recently announced Winter Guard wave that's going to be coming your way in summer, August. August sounds right to me. We don't have a BK anymore. BK, welcome the little bundle of joy, so you won't be seeing him in the chat for a while. Uh, he's on well-deserved family leave as he uh, enjoys his first child. So, with all that exciting news like wrapped up and everything just going super, super well, did we post the new mini extravaganza schedule, Summer? Did we? Did he come in today? Oh, coming today, but not up yet. Okay, well, if you're excited and hyped as we are for mini extravaganza and the reschedule and to see what new events you can expect, what changed from the old schedule before it got the sad postponement due to the COVIDs, uh, you can check that out. Sounds like later today, but all the information will be there. That will be the 14th, 15th, and 16th of July, so coming right up. With that, let's get this camera off of me and get it on the Crimson Dynamo. Let's start painting some red. So to kick things off, we are just going to dive right in with our speed paints. Uh, I'm going to be using Slaughter Red. I imagine that we're going to be doing a whole lot more work on the red than just using the speed paint itself, but... Um, my idea here is, is that this will give us a really great foundational base to work with, and that'll allow us to kind of go in and decide how we want to amp up what the contrasty speed paints give us. Um, and so we're just going to play with it. So we're going to see how this all turns out, and then we'll go back and we'll kind of muss with it and mess around with it. Like already, I feel like it's a little too red. I picked the darker of the two contrast reds, but... I feel like this is still a little too candy red and I want something a little more like crimson aggressive. So I think already in my head, I'm thinking we're gonna go back and we're gonna knock out a little bit of like a blue shade wash on this guy. And that'll bring that red back down into a nice really deep crimson color and that'll give him a bit more of that villainous sinister Iron Man antagonist kind of look. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can approach Dynamo. He's been obviously featured many different times in many different kind of suits over the course of... Oh, I'm just throwing my, throwing my brush around. Uh, over the course of the Marvel Universe's kind of history, this Crimson Dynamo definitely one of the more modern interpretations. Um, we were really inspired when it came to developing and designing the Winter Guard with the current iteration of the team from like the 2018 uh, Avengers run, where the Winter Guard uh, kind of gets reinstated due to the changes with the Avengers, with Black Panther taking over as the leader of the Avengers and then becoming more of an international kind of uh, super team in terms of their global reach and all the stuff that they're trying to do. And so, of course, all of the world governments kind of respond with like reactivating their own unique domestic teams. The U.S. grabs our favorite boy, U.S. agent, little John Walker, and kicks off a new team there. Uh, it's a pretty fun run. And then, of course, spoiler alert, the, the Winter Guard come back and uh, wind up working with Dracula, of all things, which is pretty great. Uh, fun run and definitely a big influence on kind of the designs we wanted to pull forward because we felt that modern interpretation and kind of the uh, more recent stuff paired really well with what we were doing overall with the Avengers and kind of like where we were looking at for Marvel Crisis Protocol for inspiration and stuff. And of course, the door is always open to go back and maybe do the first Crimson Dynamo or the first Red Guardian instead of, I believe, the one we did is the fifth in line for... Uh, the mantle of Red Guardian, so. Yeah, it could definitely use a black wash to bring it down as well. Um, the blue will obviously give us that kind of like purple shade, so it'll mix well with the white or with the red. And um, blue is an excellent shade in general for reds, even if you didn't want to bring it down super much, but you wanted a more natural like 
uh, shade tone. Blues, blues are the ticket with reds. They make really great, blue washes make really great shades uh, and shadows on red. And I think that we'll get more of that like deeper crimson, little hint of purple in there with it. So, But black obviously will tint everything down as well, um, just in a different way. My gosh, this new camera thing that I don't even think you're using uh, is just right in my way. <laughs> it's the third time I've lost my brush by hitting it. It's right there, Summer. Respect the length of my little monkey arms. Uh, Trauma Train Rich, what's the scale of Crisis Protocol? Um, so our scale, the basically a Captain America size individual, which is six foot one, is approximately, uh, I think he's 40, almost 42. So a six foot person would be 40 mil. Um, and that's very much so we can get all that great personality and action and they feel very heroic and you know superhuman as is their as is their way but crimson dynamo here he's obviously a bigger boy than your average like meta human cuz he's got his big bulky crimson dynamo armor on and um the suit is definitely significantly larger than like Iron Man's suit as I was telling Summer it's because you know he doesn't have all that fancy streamlined technology in it it's a bit more uh, brute force kind of stuff he doesn't have a cute little arc reactor to power everything he's got to rely on stronger Soviet era technology and stuff A lot more, a lot more initial power uh, as a result. But certainly less. Uh, what's the word I want here? The design. Um, yeah. So this is pretty much drawn directly from. Uh, gosh, I can't remember the run, but the the overall design for the suit and the choices come straight from the comics. Um, and I would have to like pull up my phone to figure out where the run is exactly. But um, if you look at the the current the current run, the twenty eighteen run, um, the suit is very similar to this. The only difference really is the helmet. Um, we liked. Uh, the previous version of the Crimson Dynamo helmet a bit more because it had more flavor and personality to it. And the arm pads are a little different between the two. Um, we went with the more robust and like chunky arm pads just to make uh, this Crimson Dynamo feel more, more powerful and a bit more imposing. Whereas the 2018 version, the shoulder pads are like rounded. They're still big. But they don't quite, they don't have the segmentation, and so they just felt, they felt a little less um, cool. And so we kind of mixed and matched between those two more recent interpretations. Um, and if I could remember the year of the run that we pulled from, I would totally tell you, but I can't off the top of my head because it was a long time ago. <clears throat> but yeah, it's, it's definitely a little bit of an amalgamation between the two, um, the two styles. They were close enough in terms of just their uh, overall design <clears throat> and look that we felt pretty uh, pretty comfortable like mixing and matching a little bit to create a to create a final like crisis protocol look for the character um, that we felt was really evocative of like where we wanted to go with everything concerning the final style and like um, his place as the the first leader of the Winter Guard, obviously, we wanted to make sure that he felt he felt like he deserved that position and stuff. Um, and we do that with pretty much every, you know, honestly, with like every single Crisis Protocol 
character that we do in the concepting and then sculpting phase, um, we're always looking at multiple iterations of the character and then kind of taking the nuances and picking out things that we like um, or that will work well in miniature. You know, a lot of it is sometimes you get some designs and you're like, well, this is, this is fine when it's a drawing, but it doesn't quite make sense or it doesn't quite read properly in miniature form. And so then the goal and the job goes to going back and like looking at different references of the character from um, different artists or different runs, different covers, and kind of identifying elements that will either address the issue or make for a better uh, final sculpt, and then applying those in a way that makes sense. So like I said, in, in this case, we, we kind of grabbed the um, shoulder pads and the helmet and mixed and matched those with the, with the look of the current, uh, the most current run to create a Crimson Dynamo that very much feels straight out of the, those comic runs, but has some unique amalgam of design um, that makes for a great miniature and really stands out among the Winter Guard as kind of like the leader of everything. There are other characters, of course, like um, the Red Guardian uh, sculpt is literally just a one-to-one -one of the current comic look. Um, so if you kind of take a look at that 2018 run, uh, Red Guardian, you'll see that it's pretty much straight. It's a straight representation. And it does, you know, a lot of that comes down to like how simple is the costume or outfit design, you know, Red Guardian is basically just in a, he's in a superhero suit with a shield. Um, there's not too much that you have to be worried about when you're looking at plastic tolerances and pull and draft angles and all that. So you get a lot of leeway there. It really just came down to having the sculptor really dial in and nail that superhero physique and pose and feeling. Um, but so much of that Red Guardian Sculpt is really centers around um, the anatomy of the character and the pose and, and hitting that like he feels like a very um, patriotic statue that you would see in like a Central Park or some kind of monument station. You know, he's got that, that beautiful pose and all the chiseled features. And so that kind of makes up in some ways for the simplicity of the costume design because um, otherwise he's just, you know, he's just a dude in a stretchy skin tight suit. All right, so this did dry a little darker um, than it goes on, which is great. That was my hope when we picked it. <clears throat> uh, so this red is the Army Painter Speed Paint Slaughter Red. Slaughter Red. And we're going to go and muss with it a bit. So obviously, as a speed paint, you know, with the contrast method, you can just slap this paint on, let the shadows and the highlights do their thing, and, you know, call this good. And this could certainly be a perfectly great um, tabletop miniature for playing games and stuff. I'm going to push this a little bit further, though, because we're only 14 minutes in. And speed paint is speedy, so we got more time. Uh, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some cyan ink and some crimson ink, and I'm going to kind of mix stuff together. Uh, Fabu Caribou. Give us any ideas on what Winter Guard will be doing in their game play field on the table. Yeah, so um, I think, you know, BK and Summer kicked things off really well by showing <laughs> Crimson Dynamo first as the leader of the affiliation and stuff. Um, his leadership kind of gives you an idea of generally what the Winter Guard play style and feel is like. Uh, we really wanted that indomitable, like, tough, um, powerful, intractable kind of, like, group. Um, you know, evoking the kind of idea that these, these characters get on to their positions and they're very hard to remove. They're very hard to move. So you'll see a lot of defensive um, 
a lot of defensive kind of tech. Crimson Dynamo, you know, he's got a couple different ways to really blunt enemy attacks between his ability to force rerolls and then his innate damage reduction. Um, and you'll you'll see that like Red Guardian is another one. Um, he is he is quite um, defensive in terms of like what he does on the tabletop and and kind of how he uh, can reduce enemy offensive capacity between pushes and his abilities, both his metahuman abilities and then his gear abilities between the shield and stuff. So um, that was very much kind of the overall direction. And then you have <clears throat> uh, Ursa Major, who's uh, the slow, kind of the slower moving, but super heavy hitting bruiser of the squad. Um, so he'll take a little bit to get there, but he can definitely tank all of the damage before he gets there. And then once he gets there, he's going to really mess you up with his bare arms. And then Dark Star is kind of an interesting one. She has a bit more, she brings utility to the team, um, but also has a lot of um, pretty strong hitting potential. So that is kind of like the overall, you know, when you play, when you play Winter Guard, um, the goal is kind of to let you feel like that, that big dominating like Russian machine, right? Um, you're not particularly flashy. Uh, they're not a they're not a very nuanced affiliation so much you know they're not they're not trying to outmaneuver you or uh, beat you through clever technology like they're just gonna come at you and be like can you can you deliver a punch strong enough to knock us down and if you can't can you suffer the uh, the return attack you know can you take our big punch? So like a heavyweight boxer in a lot of ways was a little bit of that feel, you know, Ivan Drago kind of style. And their tactic cards definitely play into that as well with a lot of, um, a lot of pretty fun effects that just lean more into their kind of brute force playing style. However, unlike the Black Order, which is very much... Um, you know, an affiliation that focuses primarily on taking out, like just completely taking out the other team. Um, the Winter Guard is definitely more on the completing objective side, uh, just doing so through kind of their tenacity and their, their resilience. And again, the leadership kind of shows that, right? You, you, can, never, you can never effectively stagger them. Um, the leadership basically just says, we are immune to stagger. Um, so they're kind of like as inexorable as, as, inexorable as the uh, Russian winter. And then, of course, once they get on their objective, and you, it's going to be very difficult to move them off. Like you're not guaranteed because of the anti-push tech that they have going on as well. So that, those kind of ideas run through everything that's there. Um, they take, they take territory and they sit on it is effectively kind of their, their aim. And this is, you know, again, kind of pulled from the most recent run of the comic um, interpretation of the team because in the, uh, in the current run, that 2018 run where a lot of the inspiration for their design and stuff came from, they're not really a, uh, they're not really anything more than a response force. You know, they have an agenda and they will go out and kind of enforce that agenda, but they're largely there as a security force and a check um, against the fears of like the Avengers being this more international kind of concerned team under Black Panther's leadership. And, uh, you know, they don't like every government because, you know, in that run, pretty much every single world government kind of takes the same stance of we need to reactivate our own super team to check the Avengers. Um, their government is not super interested in just having the Avengers just show up and do whatever they want whenever they want based on their own prerogatives. So they kick in the Winter Guard to make sure that 
they have kind of an answer to outside interference, as it were. And uh, so that was kind of the thing, right? They're, <clears throat> they're not a proactive force. They're not going out. You know, in some of the versions of the Winter Guard, they're obviously out there uh, trying to impose the will of their leaders on other people, and therefore the Avengers have to come in and, you know, stop them before they can complete their goals. In this case, it's kind of the opposite, where the Winter Guard are more there as the force to make sure that their country and their government is not imposed upon an outside thing. Uh, do we give a release date for these characters? So currently they're scheduled to release in August uh, alongside the amazing Malekith, who we showed off right before them. I guess he was the, uh, was he the last preview before these guys? I think so. I think he was the end of mini stravaganza previews, I think. Um, and then all of the cool stuff in the S.H.I.E.L.D. vs. Hydra trailer, like new Red Skull, new Captain America, original Human Torch. All of those characters will be coming out after, later on this year. So, following the Winter Guard uh, release. Um, the, so, as far as like other characters affiliated... Um, it's a fairly compact, a lot like the Midnight Suns affiliation. We wanted to keep it, whereas with some affiliations, we kind of look at um, larger legacy uh, teams and groups. For the Winter Guard specifically, they were one a lot like the Midnight Suns where we kind of kept it more limited in terms of which characters were available based really strongly on theme and um, comic history, so you're unlikely to see characters like Colossus just because he's Russian running around with the Winter Guard. It's it's a lot more focused on, you know, do you have a membership card? <laughs> Actively have a membership card. Um, and, you know, a lot like the Black Order and, and some of those other uh, affiliations, it means that there are still really cool places to go in the future for the affiliation. You know, there is, there is potential growth there. But like we always talk about, um, we always design and develop and test affiliations to be as complete and fully functional as possible if they never got anything else in the future. So <laughs> no one's likely going to be building, you know, Winter Guard as a solo... Uh, roster affiliation anytime soon. They're definitely a splash affiliation um, just based on the number of characters available to them. Similar to like Midnight Suns and stuff like that where you're not going to get 10 affiliated characters right out of the gate. Okay. Well, now we got this guy nice and dirtied up, and he's definitely a lot more crimson-y. Oh, let me get this little knee bolt that I missed. Really quick. I suppose we could go back and decide that those are going to be metallic or something, because we're going to do our silvers here in a moment. But for right now... Those red. There we go. Uh, let's see. Are we planning on more new character reveals for Mini Strav? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we still have a couple of things left to uh, to maybe surprise folks with. There's always stuff. Trust me. There's there's always stuff. We have so many things. Um, it really wouldn't matter which month Mini Stravaganza was. We would have things to show and new things. So, well, um, a lot of the discussion and the things that we're really gonna be looking in depth at are the items that we previewed. 
Um, we will still have some cool reveals and some exciting things to show off that wouldn't have made it into the original mini stravaganza. So I guess that's kind of the benefit. You get you get double the mini stravaganza like action from the delay because you got all you're gonna get all the stuff that you would have gotten and you're getting extra stuff that you wouldn't have gotten. It's amazing. It's so good. Yep. <laughs> Malekith is that yeah. We're gonna talk uh, we're gonna talk quite a bit um, about that character and Dallas has some very fun stories about how his design process went. Uh, as a little teaser, he wasn't always on the Bat Tiger. That came that came later. Um, but he had a very a very fun and interesting kind of like Genesis story uh, to get him to where he is now, which is in his incredible. Uh, heavy metal side of a van style. Okay, let's see. I need let's just figure out. I'm just gonna figure out which red I want to do next here. I think it's gonna be a little too bright. I'm just gonna quickly find a maybe. Maybe we'll figure this out. Lay poke. Oh no. There. I'm gonna grab some fuchsia from the scale. Ooh, it's very lipsticky. Um, I'm just trying to find the right red here. I think that'll be okay. That'll probably work. So I'm just looking, I'm just mixing up a really quick red. I want to kind of mess with it. Just so I can go back through and kind of start picking out some of the areas here. Because well, I don't mind the fact that he's kind of rough looking and splooty. I do want to make sure that we still have our nice, like, good highlights and everything here. So we're just going to play with some of our red colors and our options and see where things go. But this Antares red that I have is really bordering on primary red. I think it's too bright. So I'm just trying to like kind of dull it, bring it back down to a crimson here. There we go. That'll work. So. All right. So I'm just going to go through really quick and kind of like pick out some areas for stronger red highlight and then in places where I feel like my wash has gotten a little too thick I might go through and try to smooth some of that out and just do a little reclaiming but for the most part I'm pretty happy with where we are right now it's definitely very grungy which is all right. Okay. So let's just see how that color is looking. So I'm just kind of playing around a little bit here, just trying to figure out where I want to go with this. And this is definitely that step where you do not in any way, shape, or form have to do this to get a really great looking completed mini. Um, it's just kind of a place that I want to be right now. Because I kind of want to go that little extra step. We got 30 minutes and the steel, the metallics aren't going to take super, super long. So 
I feel like I got a little bit of time to kind of mess with it. And so I'm willing to kind of put in the extra bit of effort. Just to kind of get a cool result. Um, so mostly what I'm doing here is kind of explaining the thought process is very much like a traditional kind of edge highlight where I'm just going through and looking for those really hard edges that would catch the light. And then I'm taking my brighter Antares red that I mixed with a little bit of my cyan ink. And just trying to pick out some of those edges. Uh, and this just increases the kind of the contrast and gives it that extra pop. And then after this, we could, if we wanted to, kind of go back through and do like a really thin red glaze uh, just to tie everything together because we're working with a couple of different, couple of different reds now. Another way that you could do this, which would work pretty well because this, mini this miniature has a lot of sculpted detail. He's got like those little pock marks and the battle damage is kind of like wear and tear on him. Um, doing like a dry brush would work pretty well on him. He would take dry brushing really well because he's got a lot of good texture. And so you could dry brush all the color on and kind of build your layers up that way. And that could be very successful and, you know, easy to do. So there's a lot of different ways to approach this next step. There's a way to go. <laughs> you know, we've said from the beginning, like, we can't talk really at all about unannounced future releases. So, well, as much as I'd love to give everybody the answers that they want on who's coming and when and what to expect, Some things are outside of even Simone Elliott's power to do. And if they're out of her power to do, then I definitely can't do them. But yeah, all I can really advocate for is, you know, patience. We say it all the time. There's an entire universe of amazing Marvel characters. You know, universe willing. We'll get to all of them eventually, but sometimes you're just going to have to wait a little bit longer than others. It's kind of like the lot. It's a little bit of the luck of the draw. You know, I saw a lot of folks who really were just like, I can't believe they did the Winter Guard. I never thought that this would happen. I was like, yeah. Sometimes we like to surprise people, to dig into that well and go to things that, you know, maybe aren't the norm. And a lot of the times you're like, oh, this character's crazy popular. Of course they do them. Of course they do this version, you know. It's kind of all, all how it works. But... Plans go out pretty far, so. And we've got advocates for literally every character in this building, I think, in some way or another. So no one's really left in the dirt. I don't think we've had a discussion about anybody thus far in the entire time we've been doing Marvel Crisis Protocol where a character name hasn't come up and somebody hasn't gone, oh yeah, that person would be really cool to do. We should do that person. We should do that character. Like there's always somebody internally who advocates for everybody, no matter who they are. 
from your Crimson Dynamos to your Captain America Sam Wilson's to your Black Order. Everybody's got their comic runs and stories and characters that they just super identify with and love and want to see, you know, taken care of, so. And then, of course, we get to work with our great partners at Marvel, and, you know, it's, it's uh, another fantastic resource and kind of guidance on things to think about and what's coming next. What maybe makes sense, what maybe we should hold off on. So it's always a dialogue. Always a dialogue. And there are definitely times where, you know, we've had things in some form or another in the works forever. And then they kind of get moved on the schedule or pushed to the side for X, Y, or Z reason, and we come back to them later. I know a lot of folks out there really love to try to use the CP numbers of products as some kind of divining rod to figure out, like, what's there and what's next. And at this point, I think the only thing that they really tell you is that we're working on a lot of things. There's a lot of things on the catalog because those – those numbers are all accounted for. So if you see the highest number that exists currently that's been announced, the only thing you can know for sure is that every number leading up to that has a product assigned to it. It doesn't really say anything about when they'll release because they're not in order, but they exist. There is a product in place for all of them. And that's really crazy to think about. Just an amazing, an amazing journey so far with everybody and watching the game grow and evolve and take off. And then getting to work with all these fantastic and amazing creative people at the studio and continually push ourselves and come up with whatever's next, all the cool things we get to do, which characters are coming, all that stuff. A blast. Been a blast, and we're not even close to done. So much more good stuff to come. Got away from me there a little bit. Okay, well, we got 20 minutes left, so. Huh. Already released miniatures that got pushed back in the store there? Um, things happen all the time, so, you know, we talked a lot. I mean, everybody's kind of experienced it. Um, but obviously the global pandemic changed a lot of plans and um, really affected kind of our scheduling and what we expected. Uh, there are certainly things that, because of all of the things that COVID affected, the dates got changed based on, like, you know, it's a little bit of a domino effect. You Sometimes there are products that and characters that are going to come out based on the release of other things, you know. Um, terrain's pretty a pretty good example of it. We always try to have some kind of thematic tie-in terrain for some of our bigger releases and things like that. Um, so if something moves back, that might shift other things. And then there are times where that move affects other things in production. Like, it's a lot of wild stuff. Um, the second wave of mutant characters... Like the Colossus, Gambit, Juggernaut. 
Rogue, all that stuff. That was definitely one where, because of how the global pandemic affected everything, um, they wound up being kind of further delayed in terms of their release window to the original, to the first wave of the mutant characters because we didn't want to not have the first X-Men and Brotherhood kind of releases out in that, um, in that year that they released. So we wound up, <coughs> We wound up in a situation where there was a bit more of a gap in between them than we had originally expected and planned. And, you know, a lot of that is like, I think Dallas kind of says it best. He's like, if you've got a bunch of people and they can pack or ship 100 boxes a day and those people can't ship boxes for five days, now you have 500 boxes, it's not like they can suddenly just move through those 500 boxes and get back to everything else. It's You can still only ship 100 boxes a day, and that's just kind of true of bandwidth in general. So a lot of little things, you know, and then everybody was affected different. Sometimes, you know, you'd have an artist who couldn't make their deadline because of X, Y, or Z reason, and it was a lot of it's just a lot of learning and adaptation. Much of it, you know, as with everything, affected by the pandemic and how that just changed everything in terms of, you know, logistics and timelines and shipping and all that. So there's not really any exciting stories to, to honestly share. <laughs> It's it's all just kind of like humdrum, oh, yep, this thing was on time. Now it's not because of these reasons, so you kind of work around it. And then sometimes you shift, you know, you shift certain things in the schedule because other things can't make it with them and you want to keep them together, and so that can have a delayed effect too. All right, I'm pretty happy with where this, whoop. I was pretty happy with where this red was. I'll just fix that. A little excessive amount of paint there. Call it good. Sweet. Okay, so let's go on to our silvers. There. All right, so we got some really, really good stuff going on. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, just like we get to make really crazy and awesome stuff, but like every other business in the like every other company and studio on the on the business side of making things um, the logistical challenges and delays and timelines and all of that stuff that COVID has brought have affected us just the same so it's been a lot of working around that and then figuring out like where you can have a great impact where you need to shift things it's definitely very dry it's not nearly as exciting as having hulk throw a garbage truck into ah my brush having hulk throw a garbage truck into the juggernaut not nearly as exciting as that okay let's go ahead and jump into our silvers so i'm just going to use some thrash metal here and we'll knock out the metallic parts, which are just going to be the banded armor on his arms and his legs. And that's really going to be it. We could mess around with his like back generator pack and probably pick out some colors there. Um, but, you know, comic book artists don't really worry about that part. They just make it red. So why should we as miniatures painters really worry about it? Because we're painting comic book characters. So let's paint them like comic book characters. Just keep it simple, Summer. Just keep it simple. Simple, simple is our mantra. But yeah, 
And the honest truth is, is that if it doesn't bother you to have the back generator not painted, you're going to be the one staring at the back the most often because your miniatures are always facing away from you. We just talk about how important it is to, you know, spend the most amount of time on the, a miniature's face and it's kind of like its upper chest region because that's what draws the eye. That's where people look first. And then you can kind of cheat uh, and not pay as much attention to like the lower torso, the legs and all that stuff. The back of the miniature for sure nobody really looks at too too closely it's like well that's only true until you until it's you and then you just stare at the back of your miniatures non-stop it's the only part you ever get to see really because <laughs> they're always marching away from you it's very sad marching to glory Uh, will crisis cards be treated as tactic cards? Well, everything. So, I mean, crisis cards, tactic cards, really, it's all the cards that there are. Um, because we're not talking about stat cards and character cards. All of those can be rotated. At the time, um, like currently, they obviously aren't, aren't rotated out. And the big thing with the rotation too is, you know, just like the banned and restricted list, and really the set rotation is basically a more elegant banned and restricted list in a lot of ways. Um, cards can rotate in and they can rotate out and they can come back, you know, just because web barrier, for instance, is not part of the current rotation um, in standard. And that assumes that you're playing standard, which you are not compelled to play standard at all. You can just play extended or play whatever you and your friends want to play that makes you the happiest and leads to the best game experience for your group. Um, you know, WebBerry could rotate back in in a future rotation. And it's no different than, you know, we talked a lot about the banned and restricted lists when we started that process and, and introduced that. All these concepts were there at the start in those first organized play documents, you know, we talk a lot about on podcasts and especially in developer streams at mini extravaganza and stuff. We talk about how you can't go in to create a living, evolving game, a lifestyle game that consistently grows and changes and not have tools in place that allow you to kind of like manage the organic growth that will happen. Um, so the banned and restricted list was definitely one that we knew from the start we were likely going to just put in place in case we needed to implement it because we fully expected that we would, you know. Well, I would love to be able to claim that we're perfect 100% of the time. We're not. We're always learning, and, you know, things are going to fly by. There are going to be things like hired muscle where all of your testers are like, this card is fine. It's not very good. No one will really take it. And you're like, cool. Seems fine. We don't mind flavorful and fluffy cards. And then somebody's going to, you know, it's going to get out in the world and somebody's going to galaxy brain it and be like, well, if you do this with this and then this, now all of a sudden it's a problem or more of a problem than you thought. You know, we can never, we can never replicate in a controlled environment, i.e. play test, the number of games and just the pure rapid evolutionary chaos of the wild, like once a thing's out in the world, it's a whole different ball game. And it's, you know, that's just something that you accept and expect from design if you're doing this kind of stuff. I, you don't, you kind of go in with like an intent, an idea of, okay, we want the winter guard to do this. We want them to evoke this feeling. But you don't ever play test and design that way, right? Like you try to keep things to their design goals and to their flavor feels and everything, but you don't worry about, well, our intent was that this, that this character specifically does this exact thing and fills this exact role. Um, cause that's just pure folly. Cause the, <laughs> cause the general community will not, will not see it that way. You know, we all view, we all view the, 
tools in our toolbox slightly differently, especially when it comes to like army building and characters and roster generation and all that stuff. What is considered overpowered to one person might be like meh to another because of their play styles or what they value or prioritize. There are obviously certain things that everyone can kind of agree upon, but those things um, are not all the same and they're definitely subjective in many ways. You know, you can kind of say, well, if somebody has, if there's a character with 99 stamina, that character is clearly like really good, sure. But those are easy, you know, those are easy things not to do. Just don't make that character. Do, do. Uh, will characters ever be banned? We, I know that this is like something that everybody worries about, and um, <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of different like interpretations. And I think a lot of that is just people being afraid, um, because you know we spend a lot of time and energy and effort in painting and you know hobbying all of these amazing characters that we love and. They may be the only character that attracted us to the game in the first place and all that stuff. So we 100% um, understand the type of investment and love that goes into the characters and their importance to the game. So no, unless a character, like a character would literally have to be blue screening the game in a way that if we didn't immediately address the character, um, the game would just cease to function, right? Like I think we can all agree that having the game be healthy and good is the ultimate goal of everything. Because without the game, then it doesn't matter if your favorite character exists or not because you can't play the game. Um, but that's why we take things like testing and play tests and all that stuff very, very seriously. And we're very careful about making sure that, you know, it's not perfect balance. We've talked about how that's a dirty word, but how um, everything is very close to balance. And we keep that bell curve tight and then we address things as we need to. So all this to say, if there was a case where a character was released and suddenly it was just breaking the game to where the game just literally was going to cease to be, um, we would just errata the character, you know? We would change the character. We wouldn't ban the character, at least not permanently, like depending on this really outrageous hypothetical that, you know, I think we can all agree is there's a point oh 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 one percent chance of ever actually existing in a real environment, um, we might temporarily ban the character while we issued an errata and addressed the game-breaking issues, and then you could use that character again with the new card, right? Super easy. Um, the tactic cards and even the crisis cards are a bit different because, you know, there are a lot more of them. And the whole conceit is that those are an ever-growing list of things. They add complexity from a new player perspective and even from a competitive player or general, like, you know, average player perspective of as that list ever increases, the complexity and the knowledge that you have to have in order to create strategies and work around them becomes more and more, like, exponentially harder. Um, and they're not, they're not the stars of the game. You know, they're an important... They're an important piece to the overall game experience, but they're not why the game exists. They're not the game themselves. They're there to add, you know, interest and value and choice to the game. So, you know, the idea that these things rotate in and out, and if you want to play with all of your stuff, you totally can. There's, like I said, there's extended. There's just whatever you want to do in your own games with your own groups, no one's going to stop you. I don't have a helicopter to airdrop in and steal all your stuff if you're not playing the way that we think you should play. And that assumes that there's even us thinking there's a way you should play, you know. Um, 
when it comes to like what you're doing with your friends or your local communities, do what makes you happy. Do what brings you joy. My only thing is always make sure that, you know, you're as concerned, if not more concerned with the enjoyment of the person you're playing against than your own. Uh, because without that person next to you or across from you, you're not going to have any fun, period. You have to have somebody to play with. That's the whole nature and beauty of these games. So with that in mind, right, play extended, play standard, play play straight out of the core book, which doesn't have either of those formats because those formats are all organized play formats. They're not even, I mean, if we get down to brass tacks, they're not even technically the way you play the game because... They're not part of the core rules, right? These are, these are all based around community play and organized play ideas. And um, they're methods to kind of grease the wheels of community play when you don't know the person you're playing against, right? Um, they give everybody a, a shared foundation and set of expectations which is really important because if I don't know who you are, that's kind of like the most important element of actually coming together and enjoying these games. We have to know kind of like we have to have that agreement, that societal agreement of what we expect from our game, the conduct that we're going to kind of hold ourselves to, the general rules, right? And the base game does do that and it works perfectly well, but... You know, a lot of players and communities want to go a bit further. Or again, as I said, as the game expands and grows and people take it into different directions, you need those supplemental like rules and ideas on how to do stuff. So for example, you know, Marvel Crisis Protocol is not about competitive tournaments because it's not in the core rules. The base game has nothing to do with that. You can play competitively if you want. You can hold, you know, a tournament and have a bracket and, and put your skills and your strategy, your team competition to the test against other players um, and see, you know, how well you do, learn your lessons, come up with what you can do better, how you can improve, see how you've grown, all of that stuff. That's all great. But, you know, if you're going to argue that, the core rules are what govern everything. The core rules tell you nothing about that. So documents like the Challenger documents, documents like the Battle Realms document, the Collector document, they simply provide that foundation of, okay, you want to go beyond the core rules and you want to play the game in a different way under a different format. Here's our suggestion for how to do that. And we suggest it because we believe in it the most and we think it's you know it provides the best overall experience for the vast majority of players to play that way and it allows us the framework and the structure to think about these things as well because we want to make sure that like we've talked about you know with ultimate encounters and everything else that there are a number of robust and different experiences whether you want to play ultimate encounters whether you just want to play for funsies and only use the core rules you know at home or at your game store or whatever um, or you want to go into a kind of a more competitive we're going to play we're going to play in a bracket kind of tournament setting you know all those things are things that we're thinking about as we design and develop they're not the sole focus of what we design and develop but they're kept in mind and we're looking at that stuff because we want to make sure that all of those different expressions of how to play um, are accounted for and some things will be better in certain formats than others you know that's okay but all that to say, no, characters, there's no intention to ever ban a character or rotate a character from, you know, the standard expressions of gameplay. Um, the timeline documents allow us the opportunity to do narratively cool stuff. Like, for example, maybe we want to and I'm going to throw out bad examples, so, you know, fair warning. These aren't super well thought out. They're just off the cuff as I'm trying to highlight my metallics here. Like, maybe we want to do a fear itself timeline event. And so we're like, 
here's the stuff, here's what you can use, these are the characters. And there are certain things like Hulkbuster wasn't in Fear itself, so you can't use Hulkbuster. You know, like, can you never use Hulkbuster again? No, just not in that event because that's what we want to do. The timeline events give people the chance to do that. Maybe you want to do a, you know, a 4th of July, like you want to hold a 4th of July celebration event. And you're like, you know what, we're just really going to, we're going to embrace, like you can only take Cabal and Avengers characters because I don't know why. Eventually it would be like Hydra and Shield. Only Hydra and Shield. So timeline event, only these characters because we're celebrating the United States 4th of July independence. And this is how we want to do it. Great. Now the rules exist for that, right? So it's like totally fine. Um, that doesn't mean that those characters are rotated out or banned. It just means that there is now a method and a system that, again, provides a foundational way for every player to know exactly what the expectations are for events, people, and stores or communities to use when they want to do that stuff, and for us to use when it makes sense and works to, you know, the greater benefit of the experiences we're trying to like put through. Okay, I need some yellow. Yellow ink would be nice. There we go. Let's do a little, let's do a little glow on this boy before we wrap up, because I'm like way over time. I got lost in my talk. Lost in my talk. Slap this over the top here. And then, oh, maybe we will grab a little bit of this. And Summer's not keeping me on time. I don't know why. It's your job, Summer. Can you see me stand up? No. How would I, how would I see you stand up? My face, like, you got to come in here and stand in front of me and, like, tisk me. My face is buried in this miniature, ma'am. You are very I know. I'm in it. I'm focused. I'm on fire. All right, now we're just going to add a little bit of hot white to this star to give us our glow. There we go. Okay, perfect. Well, there's our mostly done Crimson Dynamo. I think I still have to do eyes, and then we got to do his little, like, laser blaster, his electrical arc thing. But not too bad for an hour messing around. So we got our Crimson all done. Got our steels all done. Everything's looking really good. This guy is almost ready to lead the Winter Guard on the table. So with that, thank you very much for joining us today. Hope you had fun. Uh, it was always fun to catch up, answer questions, discuss with the chat, kind of figure things going out, um, and letting people know what's going on. Be sure to tune back in tomorrow, 1 p.m. Pacific. Dallas Kemp is going to be here. He's going to be painting something Star Wars, but I don't remember what because I didn't look at the schedule. I'm bad. Um, and then I'll be back here next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, actually, I won't be. It'll be Dallas Kemp two days in a row because I, I will be off. There's no streams next week. Oh, I don't know. Well, watch out for more information on that because apparently there's confusion now. Um, but we will be back, of course, the, for Mini Stravaganza. That'll be the 14th, 15th, and 16th. Don't miss it. The schedule will be going up later today, according to Summer. So you can check out all of the great content that's coming your way. Look forward to hanging out with you then. Till next time, take care, and we'll see you on the next one. Goodbye. Do 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 Crimson Dynamo Use a dynamo